Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Last time we talked about some really unexpected ways that technology might connect people, might encourage them to view parts of their body or their being as shared with other people. Today we're going to talk about some slightly more conventional techniques, in particular sperm donation. But just to back up, let's talk more generally about some of the ways that people have understood being related to other people. So we have talked about processes of doing or becoming related. So for Karsten's example among the Linkawi, right? Relatedness isn't something that just happens automatically, but rather it's something that is created through processes of everyday care and proximity, eating together, being together as a family. And the same thing is true of Weston, right? Chosen family don't just become chosen family overnight, but rather they become chosen family through specific acts of fulfilling the role of kin. We've also talked about practices of caring and being cared for. And when we talk about the people that we care for and who care for us, we often use kinship language and legal structures in order to enable those relationships of care, sometimes in really surprising ways. Wolf Meyer, last time, and then Marshall Sollins, who we will be reading in the last week of the semester, have talked about this concept called mutuality of being, which could be interpreted in a number of different ways. So basically the idea is that something about your being, your yourself, any aspect of yourself, it could be spiritual, it could be mental, it could be physical, is shared with another person so that you are sort of part of them and they are part of you. This could be biological, like I said. So when we talk about sharing blood, we're talking about mutuality of being. But if you think about soulmates, this idea is also kind of about mutuality of being, that like your souls are part of each other in some sort of essential way. Finally, kinship also involves rights and obligations predicated on this sense of shared substance or on the sense that you are obliged to care for this other person that you have committed to caring to another person so our setting for today is denmark denmark is a tiny little country that is squished in between norway and sweden and germany it's really pretty. But relevantly for us today, it has incredibly liberal laws regarding assisted reproduction technologies and practices. So next door in Sweden, if you want the government health service to help you with assisted reproduction, you have to be married. Denmark doesn't have any requirements like that. Danish law doesn't see genetic relatedness as grounds for fatherhood. Rather, relationships of practical care are prioritized. If there's ever some sort of legal dispute between a genetic father and the social pater, in Danish law, the social pater probably has the advantage. The legitimately recognized partner of a woman carrying a child is automatically recognized as the second parent of that child, regardless of whether or not they have any genetic relationship. So if you, um, as a woman, as a socially recognized woman in Denmark, are carrying a child and you have a male partner, then even if you used donor sperm, doesn't matter. The legally recognized second parent of that child is your partner. If 
that woman's partner is female, then she has to sign a co-mothering agreement. But then she would automatically be recognized as the second parent of that child with the agreement. So not automatically, but like almost automatically. So because of Danish law and its liberal attitudes towards things like sperm donation, it is kind of a sperm donation hub worldwide. Um, Denmark exports a lot of sperm. (laughs) And so it's a really interesting place to look at the experiences of men who are sperm donors. And what we find is that, first of all, sperm donation is a contractual relationship. So Moore, today's author, tells us that at both of the sperm banks that he studied, men have to sign a contract that binds them to either donating four semen samples per month, that's roughly one a week, for at least one year, or to donating an overall minimum number of semen samples. And as part of this contract, donors accept that they may not be compensated if the semen samples fail to meet quality requirements such as sperm count or volume. So every week you commit to sending them a semen sample And it can't just be any semen sample. It has to be a good one. And this looks pretty much like the structure of contract labor. You know, if you are contracted to build something for somebody or if you are contracted to make something for somebody, then you have to produce the thing that you were contracted to produce on a particular schedule and it has to meet particular requirements, right? If you get hired to make a website for somebody and the website is late, you know, maybe you're not going to get paid as much. If you are contracted to make a website for somebody and that website doesn't really work very well, you might not get paid very much, right? This is exactly the same, but the thing that you are producing if you are a sperm donor is sperm. Additionally, Moore tells us, Danish sperm banks neither inform donors how many children are born with their semen, nor whether their semen is used at all. And sperm donors transfer all rights to their semen to the sperm bank and waive any fatherhood claims to possible offspring. So if you are a sperm donor, you are providing these regular samples of sperm And you also then from there have no idea what happens. Does your sperm get used? Who knows? If your sperm got used, did it result in any births? Who knows? Certainly you do not know. So men have this sort of dissonance between how they perceive themselves, what they think they're doing, and what they think the sperm banks are doing. And they're not always super happy about it. So one of the men that Moore interviewed, whom he calls Magnus, says, when you look at the sperm bank's donor catalogs, you will read that the donors are tall and blonde and handsome and have an IQ of over 200, but that's not true. That is not what the world actually looks like. But of course, that is the product for sure. That's what they live off, selling semen. So this man, Magnus, has this very clear sense of himself as a product or as the origin of a product and as an origin that maybe doesn't match what's being sold. And this was actually a really common attitude that sperm donors had and You know, some of them had a sense of craftsmanship or pride in producing a quality product. Some sperm donors felt really alienated by the relationships that were available to them with sperm banks. And so some of them also sought out private arrangements that had a less contractual, more kin-like feel to them. So, you know, if you arrange privately to donate sperm to somebody, then 
you know who they are, you know if they used it, you know if it worked out, maybe you can have some ongoing contact with any children that are produced. At the same time, some of these men do view themselves as sperm entrepreneurs. So some want this to feel more like kinship. Some of them want it to feel more like a business. Some of them are sort of confused about, is this a kin producing practice? Is this a way to make money? I don't know. What am I even doing? This is in part because the relationships between sperm donors and donor conceived children I mean, those two terms are both so awkward, sperm donors and donor-conceived children. These are relationships we don't really have good names for. So what rights and obligations might donors have to children conceived with their sperm? Legally, of course, they sign away any rights or obligations or claims. But morally? Do they maybe have some sort of obligation? Might they feel some sort of fatherhood obligation in spite of the legal situation? Do they have maybe the right to provide um, information to their children about who they are or the obligation to provide information to their children about who they are, maybe about, you know, their medical history, for example, um, or just, you know, generally who they are in terms of children asking that question, where do I come from? Do they maybe have emotional rights or obligations towards children conceived with their sperm? And many of these men who are donating sperm also have more clearly defined kin relationships with life partners, um, with acknowledged children that they're helping to raise. And then also they might have these donor-conceived children, who knows, they don't know. (laughs) And sometimes there is some tension in that respect in terms of feeling like you are being a good father to these children that are at home with you, but maybe you have other children out there and you're not doing anything for them. Or maybe if you knew whether or not you had other children out there, it might threaten the relationship that you have with your partner or your children because there would be these other people who had your children. There would be other children who could make claims on your time and attention. Donors have to choose whether or not to be anonymous. They don't have to be in Denmark. Um, If you choose not to be anonymous, you, of course, will not find out from the sperm bank what happens to your sperm, but it does leave open the possibility that later um, parents or children could contact you. So that could be scary if you think that maybe donor-conceived children might be a threat to your acknowledged, more traditional family. So in the absence of existing legal or social frameworks for what these relationships are, sperm donors and families with donor-conceived children are still in the process of negotiating these questions as best they can. What kinds of rights and obligations might exist, if there are any? Moore tells us that Danish sperm donors make sense of biogenetic connections to donor-conceived individuals with reference to, but also beyond, kin-relatedness. We know that sperm donors more widely are known to experience stress and concern about the well-being of their potential children who are out there, but they don't know where they are. Moore tells us that connections to donor-conceived individuals are, as Felix pointed out, only biogenetic, and donor-conceived individuals thus do not qualify as children. So they're they're hard to name. And the legal situation is one of contractual obligations. But even though they were uncomfortable with the relationships as set up, they didn't have a way to talk about better ones. So I'm going to leave you there in this place of confusion. But here are some links that you might want to visit in order to investigate the world of sperm donation for yourself, if nothing else, 
Have fun searching the Sperm Bank catalog. I will talk to you next time.